So we know that it's important for people to be able to disconnect from work. We also know that some professions have much higher rates of stress and burnout than others. A Beyond Blue study has found depression among doctors is particularly high. Over 8% of female doctors and 5% of men say they're depressed, compared to 6.9% and 3.7% in other professions. And when it comes to burnout, although doctors report emotional exhaustion across all ages, it is significantly higher among juniors. Almost half of 18 to 30 year olds feel burnt out, compared to just over a third of 31 to 40 year olds. Now, these statistics will be all too familiar to doctor and author Yumiko Kadota. Her new book, Emotional Female, tells the story of why she ultimately had to walk away from the public hospital system and she joins me now. Welcome to the drum. Hi, Julia. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Now, I love the title of your book. Can you tell us why you decided to call it that? It actually came from an insult. I was called that during work in 2018 and I decided to reclaim that work a little bit like um, Hillary Clinton being called Nasty Woman. Right. Um, and tell us the context in which, in which you were called it. Yeah, so this was a phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning. I was doing a 24-hour on-call shift at the hospital and I got called about a very non-urgent issue. I was on-call for emergency, so I found that it was important for me to explain why it was inappropriate to call on-call doctors at that time of night, um, especially as a lot of us are doing consecutive on-call shifts. And so I, you know, politely but firmly said that it was inappropriate to call at that time about a non-urgent issue. And the male doctor I was speaking to was not impressed and decided to call me an emotional female. Now, you probably, I'm guessing that you didn't hear any of your colleagues, male colleagues get called emotional men at any particular time. Tell me, do you think this, this uh, kind of a dismissive attitude to women or derogatory kind of uh, b behaviours expressed towards women, is that common in the medical profession? Definitely. It was definitely a gendered insult. I can't imagine any of my male colleagues ever being called emotional. It seems to be something that's exclusively aimed at women. And I do think that there is sexism and misogyny in the medical profession, and particularly in surgery, surgery because it's such a male-dominated specialty. Can you give us some examples? Like, what did that mean for you? Yeah, I mean, sometimes it was subtle, other times not so much. For example, if I were playing music in the operating theatre, I've had a surgeon walk in and say, what's this music? I feel like I've walked into a tampon commercial. So I've had <sighs> remarks such as that. Um, other times it's a little bit more subtle. I think there are a lot of unconscious biases, um, even from uh, patients as well. It's not just my colleagues. I do remember, you know, elderly patients being surprised to see a woman as their treating doctor. So I've had a few remarks like, oh, a lady doctor. So <laughs> that's fairly common as well. And just, I guess, this idea that a young woman could possibly be the operating surgeon comes as a shock to a lot of people. Um, I do remember running a consultation with a patient, explaining exactly what the procedure would involve, obtaining their informed consent for surgery, and then wheeling the patient into the operating theatre and them saying, oh, are you the surgeon? So <laughs> I'm, I'm met with surprise a lot. And right. I, I think that a lot of um, women surgeons feel like they always have to prove themselves somehow, even though we're equally qualified. Um, you... you Talk about, you write about the kind of the astonishing hours that you work and the pressure you're under, 19 days straight, mm. on call for 24 hours at a time. How can you not get burnt out with those kinds of conditions? Oh, it's impossible. It's not sustainable to work those kind of hours. Um, there's both physical and emotional exhaustion when you're working those kind of hours. And there's just no protection of registrars who are doing those kind of shifts at the moment. Yeah, right. So, so is, but do you think there's enough of a, of, a, of a pressure to be shifting, shifting that? Because it just seems completely unsustainable. Yeah, definitely. I, 
I feel like a tragedy has to happen before things change. For example, in the ENT special specialty, there was a registrar who committed suicide. And just now you shared the statistics about mental health among the medical profession. But after that suicide, the ENT specialty decided that there has to be a minimum of three doctors that share the on-call roster. But sometimes I think to myself, what has to happen for things to change? It's, it's not acceptable for something that terrible to happen before we change things. Hmm. I just want to, going to bring in the rest of the panel because I want to ask you, Priya, if you've had any, if you relate um, to, you know, that, that this story of, of inevitable burnout and if you've, you've kind of faced some of the same struggles yourself. Look, I haven't probably experienced burnout to that degree. My husband is a surgeon. He's a plastic surgeon. And so I obviously lived with him through his training. And sadly, uh, you know, it's true. The hours are, you know, he would be on call for days and days on end. There would be no sleep. He was doing unsupervised procedures. That was the norm. That is the norm. And, you know, he is a Caucasian male. And we talk very openly in our home about white privilege. And he is a Caucasian male who kind of, you know, breezed through surgical training, like with a lot of limping along the way. Uh, but I can only imagine what it would be like a, for a female surgeon, let alone, a, you know, an ethnic or a woman of colour. Mm. Um, but, you know, I it depends how you define burnout, but, you know, I live burnout fairly frequently as a mum of two children who is trying to juggle, you know, multiple career roles in medical education as a GP in the media. And, you know, five days ago I said to my husband, I need a break. I can't, I can't look at any of you because I just, I can't think about a meal. I just, I, I was in tears. I was like, I can't do it. And so I think, you know, many of us live burnout. It depends on how you define it. But, but to actually be worn down to this degree where you are, you are literally, you know, physically and mentally exhausted, you know, that shouldn't be acceptable in any profession. Yeah, and you've got people operating on you. I mean, Yumiko, like, I mean, we, we just before coming up to the studio, we just did a quick search for are there any you know, studies showing the, the mistakes that are made by surgeons who are tired? And yes, lo and behold, you know, a, a, a study showing 300% more likely to make errors. Yeah, it's so dangerous and I always draw parallels with driving as well. Fatigue is one of the biggest killers on the roads and so if you don't want someone who's tired driving, why would you want yeah. a tired surgeon to be operating on you? And the thing with on-call as well is that studies have shown that it's not just a short duration of sleep. Disrupted sleep is actually more um, detrimental to brain function. So when you're doing this 24-hour on-call shift where you're getting called in the middle of the night Night and it's disrupting your sleep, particularly if you're in that deep REM sleep, it's very disruptive to your function the next day and very dangerous. And it's not um, a job where you can afford to make mistakes. Sometimes, you know, literally we have people's lives in our hands. So it's so important for doctors to be well rested in order to, to provide the best possible care to patients. Hmm. Corinne, have you ever experienced a period of career burnout? Yes, I have. Uh, in the days when I was a surgeon, of course. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> I've, never, I've never had a job where I've been holding someone's life in my hand. So right. I, I, I would like to say too, though, when we're talking about surgeons and GPs and anyone who works in the medical profession, there's, a, there's emotional exhaustion, but there's also vicarious trauma. And I hope that uh, the medical profession is, is taking note of that as well. When you are dealing every day with the trauma of others, it has a really detrimental effect on your own psychological well-being. And vicarious trauma is a really serious issue. And um, I hope it's something that the medical profession is looking into for themselves. Um, I, I've been burnt out a couple of times. Back when I was a performer, I was doing two national television shows, a national radio show and a sketch show all at the same time, plus corporate work. It was incredibly exhausting. I was being pulled in seven different directions every single day. And I went to a, a photo shoot, which is one of the least difficult things to do. You just have to have a, a, you know, a face full of makeup slapped on you and then sit there and smile. And I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And I had a complete breakdown and left. And I'm sure I was called the equivalent of an emotional female. <laughs> I was called a princess <laughs> for not being able to cope with it. But you never know um, what's going to trigger you, right? You never know the point, the thing that's going to set you off. That's right. That, that's, that's exactly it. With burnout, it, it's not when things are, are, are really, really hard, because at that point mm. you have to step up. It's at some point where the tiny little bit in your brain says, 
you actually can have a breakdown now, yes. <laughs> that's when you fall over. I tell you what, though, if someone called me an emotional female now, <laughs> um, they would then see what an emotional female looks like. Yeah, just calm down, Corinne. It's all I'm and saying. Yeah, if I'm I can trying. expand on something that Corinne just said. Um, yeah. um, she mentioned something about the vicarious trauma. Mm -hmm. And when we think about burnout, there's three domains of burnout. Um, the physical and emotional exhaustion is the one that is commonly spoken about. But um, the other domains include this diminished sense of personal accomplishment. And importantly for people like doctors who work in a caring profession, there is this other domain of cynicism and loss of empathy. And so the people who are the most empathetic are the most vulnerable to burning out because you have to have the empathy to lose in the first place. So when you're working yeah. in a profession where you're seeing these tragedies, whether it's cancer or terrible accidents and deaths, you do take that on. And I think that's one of the reasons why doctors are one of the most burnt out professions that we have. Yeah, that, that, that makes sense. You, you worry about a lot of people in caring professions who are looking after victims of sexual assault and domestic violence Ooh. workers and so on. Yeah. And sometimes it is also either more intense in particular professions or industries, but also countries, Adam. Mm. Tell us what it was like working in, in Japan, which is not known for its lazy uh, attitude yeah. to work. We, it's a massive issue. Overwork yeah. in Japan is an, an enormous issue. You know, I, when I went to Japan, it was also a shift for me from uh, private practice law through to you know, in-house legal, which is often considered to be a much less uh, stressful and less yeah. kind of high pressure gig. But I, I remember my first job out of law school. It was it was like a cartoon where they throw open a door and you have to review these documents. And there's literally you know three million documents you yes. have to go. And I slept under the desk and was yes. at work 24 hours a day, literally 24 hours a day, never, didn't leave for a week kind of thing. You'd have showers at work, that kind of, wow. that kind of work. And so when I moved to Japan to into in-house practice, it was supposed to be a much easier gig. I, I still found myself working very long hours, but um, because I was in a management position, part of the culture in a Japanese office is that you don't leave until your boss leaves. Um, and so I had to really, you know, I, I came from this, uh, this field where you had to work really hard because every second you worked, every six minutes you worked was an extra billable unit for, um, for yes. the, the firm, to trying to sort of shift to this more results-based way of working. And so I was very clear with my staff that I was going to leave at the end of the working day, which is 6 p.m. in Japan. I will leave at 6 p.m. every single day so you can go home whenever you want as soon as the working day is finished. And it, to me that was more about trying to, to foster a culture that was not fetishizing hard work because I think we do that far too much. Yeah. It's like hard work is always a positive. It's <laughs> it's not just uh, the path to success, it is a requirement for success. But uh, in some ways I think my own personal philosophy is that hard work can often be a sign that you're not working efficiently, that you're not taking care of yourself, that you're not actually doing the best possible job you can be doing. And so whether it's at an individual level as an employee, as a, at a management level in a company or even as a, at a society level, I think we have to stop fetishising hard work and um, encouraging people to actually take more balance into their life. Mm. Um, Yumiko, I, I'm also conscious that with studies of trauma they show that um, that, that, that women can experience it more because of dealing with racism, with, with sexism in certain in, in uh, certain environments. People of colour can have a g worse experience of trauma in any given work environment because of experience of racism. There was that also a, a problem for you. It was. Um, I experienced both sexism and racism in the workplace. Um, not always from colleagues, but patients as well. Again, so I remember a patient saying to me after seeing me walk in, oh, I'll have an Aussie, thanks. And that was probably the most shocking wow. um, example of racism I experienced as a, as a junior doctor. So these are very, sometimes not so subtle, but layers that build up over time. So it's not just the physical hours, but mm. all these other things that happen at, at work that built up to, I think, my, my experience of, of burnout and, and eventually developing clinical depression because of those things. And, and we also don't talk about the kind of the unconscious biases and the microaggressions that happen in the workplace. And that, that really um, takes a mental toll on you as well. Yeah, um, it, it's such an interesting book and you've, you've told your story so well, Yumiko. What do you want 
people to kind of take from it when we think about burnout we think about the pressure we put on ourselves mm. and the expectations on other people what do you want them to you know put your book down and walk away thinking about yeah I'd, I'd like to echo the sentiment um, that um, Adam was talking about before about not fetishizing hard work and that there's so much more important things than work and we often define ourselves um, with our roles and I want people to detach from those external factors because I often say to medical students medicine is what you do not who you are so to be able to separate yourself from work especially when you work a lot when you work so many hours you kind of become the, your role rather yes. than yourself and so I really want people to put their own physical and mental well-being first. No job is more important than that. And that's the main message I want to, to um, yeah, get, it, get across through the book. Yeah. And hopefully by reading it, it might give some people who are in a toxic workplace some courage to, to walk away. All right. Well, thank you for your courage, Yumiko. Um, it's a really wonderful read. If this topic, I should say, has raised any issues for you, please call Lifeline on 13 11 14 or Beyond Blue on 1300 22 46 36.